Welcome to tonight's show. I've got a bombshell for our audience. I'm going to tell them something that we have never, ever disclosed on this show. We love movies. <laughs> Do we now? Yes. This is sacred knowledge, and I'm, I'm like, I feel like I'm burying my soul just saying this. <laughs> See, Evan, I thought you were going to start off with, Hi, welcome to So To Speak. I'm Evan Me. Oh no, Gruniger. But that old chestnut. <laughs> that would have been a bit. That would have been a cliche. Oh, cliche. Wait, it's a cliche to introduce the show now like a good host? <laughs> huh. Hello, my beautiful audience. <laughs> Why are we take. Don't take the piss out of the guy who's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Welcome to So to Speak. I am Evan Mead. And I'm Al Groniger. See, I just pointed that out, and now we do it again. See, this is the thing. We get comfortable, we do it, and then it becomes a rote. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Okay. But in all seriousness, we're talking about cliches tonight. Specifically, cliches that we either hate outright or find annoying. Yeah. And this is like cliches that we've noticed throughout... Some of our all-time favorite movies. I got well, now, just a couple I, I, disclaimers. I, I picked one that's a television cliche. Oh, I picked a, a tele. Well, I picked a television cliche, a, a, a cliche that is common in movies, but a TV show got right. Okay. Okay. Now Perfect. the thing about this, just because a movie has a cliche or takes advantage of a cliche, doesn't always mean the movie is necessarily bad. Although, if a cliche cl consumes consumes a movie, then I will say otherwise. But sometimes, even the best movies, which I think you're going to talk about, have cliches. Oh, yeah. There's no really... There's, there's no way to get around cliches sometimes. Sometimes there just isn't. Yeah. But then that's what I want to address. For this episode, what I'd like to do is I want to pick a cliche that I don't like. I'm going to talk about the worst example of this cliche that I just always... That took me out of the, the experience. And I have a few other bad examples here and there. But I also want to talk about the exception. Yeah. There's always an exception to every rule. I want to talk about a good example of this cliche where they either did it right or they subverted the heck out of it. Okay, so what's the first cliche you want to talk about? All right. Okay, so one cliche I hate, and Evan, you like this one sometimes, and there are good examples of this, but I hate what I like to call a fake-out fantasy. Uh. Now, it's always usually a character... Who's kind of like kind of mild, kind of keeps to themselves, and uh, the, the, this cliche usually plays out uh, when it, when they're uh, being talked to, talked down to by their boss or something like that. It's usually that scenario, or maybe someone they don't like particularly. And what will happen is the character automat just completely out of the blue starts attacking this person or beats the shit out of them or just shoots them outright, and it's just like, whoa, what the fuck? Like you, I, is I, that I, for real? Like and, I, I, I oh, there goes gravity. Up goes reality. Well, because it's like back to it's like, reality. Uh, yeah, you, you, I got some examples. The first movie that came to my mind when I thought about this was actually Horrible Bosses. Okay. Remember? Yeah, that's okay. But the worst example for me is Amazing Spider-Man Two, mm. when Max Dillon is just in an elevator with uh, Ryan from The Office. <laughs> And he, he oh, no fuck, he was in that movie. Yeah, yeah, B.J. Novak. But uh, he just blows up on B.J. Novak. He's like, ah! Hard yeah. cut. Uh, and it's so quick. I don't even know what the point of it was. What, Max just has anger issues or something? He, or it was internal so, it, anger issues? It was so out of place, and I feel like that was Sony's way of showing that all the Spider-Man villains have have split personality disorders which is an over which that in of itself is kind of cliche. yeah that, that one's cliche too but for honest i see this cliche more and more and more in tv and i don't like it because it feels cheap it feels like something happened but oh it didn't happen and it has no consequence so it feels like it was it felt like a waste of time and even even good movies have this cliche from from every now and then there's this one i don't know if you ever seen this one it's called you were never really there I think so. never really here. It's with Joaquin Phoenix. He plays like a oh, hitman, no, I have. A hitman or a bounty hunter or whatever. And like there near the end of the movie, like he doesn't he seems to be doing this a lot lately, but he just 
he pulls out a gun in the middle of a diner and shoots himself. And you're like, holy fuck. Well, like, I mean, I could kind of see that character doing that because he's been, like, chronically depressed the entire time. But then it just hard cuts and he's just sitting there with, the, you know, the girl he saved. Mm. And then the movie just ends. And I'm like, there's no need for that. Yeah. But, okay, so a good example... It's, it's funny. Uh, there's a movie that I know of that opens with that fake out. Uh, there's a Canadian drama. I talked about this in our Canadian movies episode one week. The okay. movie the movie opens with uh, Joshua Jackson getting told that he has stage four cancer inoperable, and so he fantasized himself taking a gun and blowing his brains out at in the first 30 seconds of the movie. Okay, well, that makes sense. So, uh, and this is where I want to kind of rotate gears, where it's like the way I could see this cliche working. It gets you in the headspace of the character. It gets you really to see like how they would view it, like their ideal perspective of how this would have played out. Mm. And like you've mentioned this just now, horrible bosses is my favorite depiction of this cliche, where oh, Jason yeah? Bateman just takes Kevin Spacey, drags him across the floor with sabotage by Beastie Boys playing right, th blowing through the speakers, and and Kevin Spacey's like, "You're you're fucking fired!" And like, I'm shit, throws him out the window. <laughs> Now, obviously, that didn't happen, but what I like about that scene is that it's so over the top and so, like, loud that I know it's fake. Mm. I, I know right away. It's not playing up my expectations. It's literally, like, the best case scenario. Everyone wants to do this to their boss. It's relatable. And uh, I have two other examples. Uh, one is Malcolm X. This is done very quickly, but there's a scene where Malcolm Little is, like, you know, he's a, he's a server. He has to deal with this obnoxious white guy. And there's, like, a quick cut where you kind of see a low angle of him just smashing, like, something over his face. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a, a bottle or, like, a, a, you know, food or something. Like, he just wants to, like, throw something right in this guy's face because yeah. he hates him. He hates being subjected to this guy and having to cater to his every whim. That puts me in the perspective of this character. But one of your favorite movies, one movie you always find underrated, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty... It makes sense that he has all these little fantasies because he's a daydreamer, right? Yeah. It fits his character. And they, and they, just like with Horrible Bosses, they blow every daydream light years out of proportion. Yeah, yeah. I like it when it goes for broke, you know? Yeah. I like it when it goes so far off the wall that it's like, yeah, of course this isn't real. But we all have moments in our day where we just kind of imagine something that we wish, like, oh, man, if, it, if this scenario turned out like this, I would have done this and this and this yeah. hard cut. Yeah, the, life doesn't work that way. I there's also, consequences. I love shit, how you know? like uh, he has that epic du Matrix style duel <laughs> yeah, with, was, Adam, with was, Adam Scott. That like, was over one of the, the over the toy. That was one of the last fantasies we had in the movie too. No, didn't he also have a fantasy where like he where um Kristen Wiig is like playing singing gu playing guitar is singing uh is singing uh, uh, uh ma ma no no uh, uh a space, space oddity, oddity by, space oddity uh, by David Bowie. David Bowie yeah that was the last one yeah but that you know what I mean like that was the most yeah. extreme one before and like he starts that, leveling out uh the problem I I love that movie but the pro a, a reasonable complaint I have with it is that it gets a little unclear as to when reality and daydreams are becoming blended and like when he jumps off the helicopter into shark infested water next to the boat it's like are those sharks real or is he daydreaming that or it's like is he daydreaming calling making an international call in the himalayas or is he really doing that oh like that's what yeah it, the second half of that movie's kind of lost me a bit too same i agree yeah. but, but no, the first half of the movie really yeah, good pretty solid movie yeah, yeah. All right, Evan, what's your cliche next? First what's cliche, your next cliche? The first cliche that I want to talk about is um, on-the-nose soundtrack choices. Oh. Now. Needle drops? W this is what I'm talking about. Okay, when I, ever since, this is a cliche I actually used to like when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Like, when I was younger and I saw a, a, saw a song that had, like, lyrics that matched perfectly with what was going on in the scene, I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But then, as I got to understand the language of filmmaking and understand that it makes more sense when a movie... It makes more sense when a movie uses its soundtrack where the song fits the tone of what's going on mm -hmm. more so than what than the lyrical content matches what's going on. If you want lyrics to match what's going on in the scene, write a musical and have the actors... Or make a music video. Or, or have the actors perform. But even music videos, like, they'll... The stories of some music videos will have nothing to do with 
uh, the lyrics, and it's like, what's going I think on? It's, I think it's better that way, because when a, um, a song plays over a scene and it's so literal, it's like I'm yeah. being hit over the head, you know? Yeah. So, um, some examples. What's the okay. worst example of this? Uh, I'll, give an exa- I'll give an example from a, a ba- an example of this cliche from a good movie. Uh, okay. In the fir- okay, in Shrek, the the soundtrack of Shrek is awesome. The one time where it was a little too on the nose is when they have I'm on my Wii from Miz to by the Proclaimers playing over. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, like, uh-huh. it, and I, it, it's too on the nose for me. I mean. It's edited very well to the lyrics, but at the same time, like it, it almost fits a little too well. Yeah, it's like he's on a journey. And yeah, he's on his way from mis. He, but he doesn't know he's going from misery to. I'm like, get, I get it. He's going from misery to what he doesn't know is happiness. I mean, it, it fits. It, it, it but fits. I see what you mean. But I see it's what like you mean. it's on the nose. Um, a ba- an example. Okay, but the worst example I've seen in recent I think years. I know. We've talked about this off the mic before is this David a Ayer real life? David Ayer's suicide is squad not okay just full disclosure da- James Gunn's the suicide squad completely fixed its soundtrack problems it's... and every single song fits <laughs> perfectly with it. but that's because James Gunn he is, a, is a master of pick right he James Gunn is one of those guys who directs his movies and writes his scripts to song to the tune of certain songs. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, that's but in but in Suicide Squad in mm-hmm. the in Suicide Squad not the Su- in Suicide Squad twenty sixteen, the problem was, at most of the songs that I remember are just there to you know force the narrative. Like, okay, so they introduced Captain Boomerang. And it's like he's he's, Aust- a, he's, he's Australian, he's Australian. Yeah, an Australian rock band. Yeah, AC, ACDC do, and Jeep. singing the most uh, overly like cliche song to play when you're catching a criminal, Dirty Deeds. Yeah. Um, another example is um, when uh, they're assembling the team and then they have Eminem going, "Guess who's back, 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 back again?" Yeah, get it because they were in jail and they're back out of jail. Oh, and you remember, oh, and you started by, that is the worst use of Bohemian Rhapsody I have ever seen yeah, in my life. It makes no like, sense. Yeah, like it's like, okay, that's another part of the cliche. Sometimes a song is so horribly placed and it doesn't match up. Or, it, it's either two on those and the opposite. The antithesis, the other side of this cliche is the song has no place in the movie at all and it's just yeah, there yeah. to score set to sell the soundtrack. There, there is a there is an art to dropping songs in movies now. Also, the original song that got written for that movie, Heathens, it's all, I, li- I was, because I worked at HMV when the soundtrack was in stores, I heard Heathens A so lot. many times. It was everywhere. Hey, all my friends are heathens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All my friends are not really my friends. Well, like, it's like, we're pretend, we're, we're, this, we're pretentious douchebags. Here's a song about pretentious douchebags. Do you ever find that sometimes you hear a song in a movie and it's like, I've heard this song used yeah. so often in a movie, now, it just removes it of all meaning. Um, I hate to be the... I mean, one of my all-time... One of my favorite songs, maybe not all-time favorite song, but one of my favorite songs, is actually overplayed. And uh, get, case in point, Give Me Shelter by the Rolling Stones. Mm. I remember watching Layer Cake with our friend Michael for the first time, and I'd never seen Layer Cake before, but when I, when there's a scene where, like, uh, the whole movie's about drug trafficking, right? And there's a scene where he's with a girl and Gimme Shelter, like, and I tell Michael, obli- this is the obligatory uh, song to play in any movie or any story about drugs or any subplot. Speaking, speaking of that, so, Flight had a lot of on the nose Neil drugs. Oh yeah, oh, I like, forgot like to mention. Like, Under the Bridge, when, like, the girl's overdosing on drugs. Oh, yeah. Under the bridge by the Chili Peppers. Yeah. Or? Oh yeah. How many other? Songs yeah, and there's are also the yeah. No, every no every single song in the flight in the soundtrack for Flight is basically Pretty. about drug use or being intoxicated. Well, even the song "Sympathy for the Devil." Yes. Whenever that was like John Goodman's lay motif. Oh, and then there's... that song's used way too goddamn much. That was even in Suicide Squad. Oh yeah. And Amanda Waller came in. Oh, by the way, do you remember um yeah. when uh oh do you remember um. I'm feeling all right. He that song is used twice in that movie. It's the theme song of the pilot that uh, yeah, Denzel Washington. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna give an example that actually yeah, used the cliche and did it right simultaneously. I know it sounds a little weird. Uh, 
So Cody texted me the other night telling me he was watching Big Fat Liar, mm-hmm. and I decided to smoke a bowl and watch the movie myself. Because <laughs> I, I have seen Big Fat Liar many times before, and I actually kind of like watching it as an adult at almost as much as I liked it when I was a kid. But I can see its flaws even more when I was an adult. Uh, as an adult. But this is the thing. Um, an example of how it uses one song badly is... So there's a scene where they uh, pour... Uh, blue uh, color dye into his into Marty Wolf's swimming pool, mm-hmm. and then they fuck with his car and completely rewire it so that every single function does the opposite of what it's supposed to do. So he presses the air conditioner button and it turns on the radio, and get, and he has a blue car. He's dyed his skin is dyed blue. What song was the biggest song in the early two thousands, late nineties that you can play? I'm blue, da, ba, da, da, ba, da. If I was green, I would die. If I was green, I would die. Da, 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 da. And it's like, okay, I saw that coming from a mile away, and it didn't bother me as much when I was a kid. But it's like, okay, like they went, they obviously went for the biggest song that had to do with being blue of the time. But here's another example: the the same movie, a few scenes earlier, they actually did it right, where they how they. Uh, Marty Wolf is like going through his morning routine and he's being this, he's dancing to this, <laughs> he flicks a switch and Hungry Like the Wolf by Duran Duran starts blasting <laughs> and it actually works because this it's established that the song is part of his surroundings and he's dancing to it like a, he's doing a cornball dance to it so in a yeah, way the name it, fits. It, wor- it fits but and it works too so oh my god so Big Fat Liar utilized both songs to the best of their ability. Like, I can't hear those songs without thinking of Big Fat Liar. Oh, yeah? They utilize, I actually think those songs are used Synonymous perfectly. with the movie. Pretty synonymous, yeah, used perfectly. And yeah. Well, Cody, Cody was kind of complaining about how it's like, Get it? Because he's blue! Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, they, oh, by it's way, a they better do, Neil drop than they when do. it was used in Iron Man 3. I mean that that was did that song come out in two thousand or nineteen ninety nine? I forget. I mean like ninety nine, I think. In Iron Man three, it didn't really match up with the scene, but it was just a big pop song that was relevant in uh, that would have been playing at every New Year's party in nineteen ninety nine. They could have used Chumba Wumba and would have made a difference. That would have been that actually would have made more sense for Tony Stark. He gets knocked down, but he gets up again. Oh my god. <laughs> Shane Black should have called me for. <laughs> oh Shane tonight. Black, you dropped the ball. <laughs> Okay, so what's your next cliche? All right, all right, all right. This one, uh, this one's not the biggest one in the world, but I gotta admit, it's always so silly to me. Hacking in movies. Uh, so when a character can just come up to a computer and say, Hey, baby, how's it going? I'm just gonna take one little peek, and all of a sudden, ten seconds later, Hey, I hacked the Pentagon. I got through the mainframe. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Like I look, like I have no doubt in my mind that there are people in this world who can get through like firewalls and all that and find your secret information, and that's why today's sponsor is NordVPN. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but yeah, I mean, in most movies, hackers have an unwieldy amount of potential to do almost anything. Yeah, Hollywood seemed to think that. Hacking a computer means I can press a few buttons and make anything that I want anywhere in the world happen inexplicably. Yeah, and probably like the most egregious example of hacking used as terrorism in movies would be Live Free or Die Hard, the fourth Die Hard. I have only seen that movie once. I've seen it a few times, and the main villains are like, oh, we we are going to hack the United States and potentially the world. And it's like, oh, good Lord. Yeah. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. It's a fresh take. Uh, and cyber, ter- cyber terrorism is actually very relevant. It and is. A hu- and a huge security concern today. Oh, it is. Yeah. I, I have no doubt. It's just like, you got Justin Long, who just seems to know absolutely everything about hacking, so he has to counter-hack the hackers and all that. It's just a now, little much. Speaking of Justin Long, did he film that movie while he was on breaks between for making apple commercials hi i'm a mac and i'm a pc <laughs> gee i wonder if that's why he was hired on board well bruce willis was already kind of a geriatric so is bruce willis <laughs> the pc <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean there's other examples of movies where hacking is kind of just yeah a fix all like a quick fix like in uh jurassic park it's a unix system i know this yeah, park fixed in a, two seconds it's a billion dollar 
fucking amusement so park. But how the hell? A fourteen-year-old girl can just come up to a computer. But and how did she? It. How did she get by without? Ah uh, ah uh, ah! Uh, you didn't say the magic Evan, word earlier uh, in the uh, movie. Uh, uh. She said she's a hacker. So oh, she can hack sorry. Anything. If it was established, then I guess setup has to have payoff. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really like that whole scene. That was cheesy. And then you have like movies where it's like I, I I think most people complain whenever there's a scene where people just sit in a computer and do something. They even make fun of that in Spider Man uh, Homecoming, where like Ned's just like, "Oh, I could be the guy at the computer." Yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, you got that movie, uh, The Core. Mary oh DJ right, Wallace. He yeah, was, like, a hacker, and you could tell he's a hacker because he had a dingy apartment full of computers and and he was and microwaving data. pizza pops at the same time with like floppy disks all over the place. Yeah, and he had to nuke those floppy disks to keep himself uh, uh yeah. get himself out of, out of jail free. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not to say hacking has always been terrible in cinema. I mean, yeah. even television. Like, you ever watch the show Mr. Robot? Uh, no. I, that whole... I feel like I should really check this out. Yeah, it's a good, 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 good show. And it's it, it's a good... I don't know if it's wholly accurate, but, you know, it's a, bit, it's a better representation of how hacking works yeah. and how p- people can, like, form squads. And if they have a goal in mind, then they'll do anything in their power to get to it. Do you want a an exa- another good example of hacking done right? The Social Network. Yeah, yeah. The, that's, the, the that, first that's pretty well twenty done. minutes of that movie is all about hacking. Yeah, <laughs> they pull like an internet prank and get in big fucking trouble. Yeah, and then by the way, apparently that was one of the. Uh, the this, obviously, the Social Network draw over dramatized a lot of uh, what what actually happened to Mark Zuckerberg when he was at Harvard. Oh yeah, it's a movie. But yeah. And then, I, I mean, of course, we have to mention The Matrix. I mean, oh yeah, that that movie is all about hacking, and yeah, it's also kind of you know over embellished and not all that realistic. But I mean, at least it makes sense and it fits the themes of the movie. Yeah, and by and remember, like hackers are good, and the government, you know, knocking on your door and taking you into custody, they're the evil fascists. You can't scare me with this Gestapo crap. F society. You can't scare me with this Gustavo crap. I know my rights. I want my phone call. There's a movie, actually, from the 90s that's called Hackers with Angelina Jolie. And I, I haven't seen it, but Mr. Robot takes the piss out of that movie didn't, any chance it can get. Didn't, uh, wasn't Chris Hemsworth in a movie a few years ago about cyber terrorism? Oh, wasn't it called Black Sheep or something? Dark, dark Hat, Black Hat. Yeah. Not Black Cat, but you know, it, it was a Michael <laughs> Mann movie. Oh, Michael Mann. Yeah, he's really good. Black Hat. It was mm. Black Hat. Yeah. That one didn't do too well. Yeah. Oh, well. That's all I have to say about hacking. I have all the cliches on my list. It's the one I don't have the biggest problem with, but I, it is very, uh, it's a very weak way for writers to kind of get away with, like, certain things. Kind of like when people just spout out tech, techno babble just yeah. to kind of explain how something happens, but I really don't care. Yeah. Just get on with it already. Oh, is that my cue to say my next pick? <laughs> what? Yeah. Go, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Excuse me. My next pick. Admittedly, this cliche has died down considerably in the last twenty years, mm-hmm. but in the eighties and nineties, this cliche was all over movies. I'm talking. Uh, America is the only country that can save the world. Like American, mm. American exceptional, mm. American heroism and American exceptionalism, and it, it, the word you use for it is jingoism. Yeah. So, okay, that I actually when I was thinking of examples, there are too many to name. Like every single action, most action movies and most disaster movies have that are made by Hollywood or were made by Hollywood over the years. They have it so that the the person who who identifies the disaster is some American scientist, and it's they also have to be the person who can save uh, the day. Um, just to name a few examples, uh, freaking, I guess Top Gun. No, nah, Top Gun's a bad example because they don't re- the, the world wasn't at stake of it, but they were like and they don't really clarify what the threat is in that movie. Well, they just said uh, tensions are high. That's literally all the stakes they got. But I'll give you another example. Um, uh, Armageddon. I mean, yeah. NASA pulls oil drillers and expects them to save the world. Even, but there are some movies where they'll 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 sprinkle in like you know 
one or two characters from another nationality that go on the mission. But even then, they're just there for comic relief and they don't press the button that saves the world and they don't make the big sacrifice or whatever. I like, mean, th this, this cliche you're pointing out goes for a lot of films by Michael Bay. Oh, don't give me... Well, like, the, the guy even made a whole movie about how America got into World War II, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, although I'm kind of t t as of this recording, Ambulance has been out for a week or two, and I'm kind of curious to see that because it kind of looks like a return to good old fashioned. I Michael hear it's Bay. pretty fun. Yeah, I'd say it with you. The only thing that I am a look that the only this is another cliche that's getting an honor I'm not talking about this cliche, but it gets an honorable mention. The sexy paramedic lady, like how is her <laughs> ma how's her makeup stay that way but through like action scenes and explosions? No, sorry. I mean I mean if I was dying in an ambulance and I saw someone like that look didn't look over like standing over yeah. me make trying to you know save my life, I'd be like Yeah. Hello, but Eric. okay Are I'm, you an angel? Oh god. <laughs> that old chestnut that's another cliche I forgot about. Well oh and then there's another so another example um ironically one of the MC, the first MCU movies, uh, capitalized on American saviorism. Uh, well, Iron Man at first, I, gonna, I thought you were gonna say Iron Captain Man, America. Iron, well, Ca the first event, Captain America, the first Avenger. That's all about American saviorism. Although yeah. they they give Cap a personality, but ultimately he's still fighting for the cause. Yeah, I, I'll say this: like Captain America could have very, very easily fallen into this hole where it's like all he cares about is America. But they do a very, very good job of just yeah. making him like you know an underdog. Yeah, making him like just want to fight for the common man. Yeah, and it's not so much like, about his country. Well, Even the second movie touched also, on that. Oh, um, another classic movie that does that's a bad example. Well, I love this movie, but it's cliche as hell. Independence Day. Like oh God, the, yes. The, the one guy, <laughs> the six billion people on the entire fucking planet, and the one guy that figures out how to stop this alien invasion is an American. Cable TV repairman who went to MIT for eight years. Well, that speech at the end. I mean, my God. Yeah. Well. Oh. Uh, but. Oh. But that's okay because the president made an awesome speech that says, "Yeah, at the end of this, if we win today, this day will not be a, an American holiday, but an international holiday." So. Um, but here's the thing. We only see the final battle from the side of the Americans. We don't see the final battle uh, from the side of the Russians or the Chinese or the Japanese. We just see how the Americans kicked ass at area 51. <laughs> and that's it. Um, I mean, that movie is almost so bad. It's good when it comes to that kind of people cliche. have said, people have it's said gloriously that gloriously over the top. It is. Um, but, but honestly though, like, um, Oh, another thing, uh, you want to talk about Michael Bay transformers. Does there have to be an American flag in every other shot of that move of those movies? Yeah. Jesus. Oh, and uh, Michael. I guess the uh, Michael Bay is secretly a military recruiter because oh that guy God. has U.S. military stock footage up the ass in the in the Transformers movies. So that's a good example of this. Okay. Seven. Could Ironic. Ironically, I actually could. And ironically, they are both. They're both comedies and they're satires. All right. Don't look up. Takes the whole concept of American saviorism and inverts it. Like. If anything, America kind of dooms the world in Don't Look Up. Okay. I mean, I, I, by the way, this is coming from someone who thinks Don't Look Up is not a masterpiece. Like, Don't Look Up is very has tons of problems, but this cliche, ironically, wasn't one of them. Okay. At first, they, they start with the American saviorism trope, but then they invert it to another trope called the rich are greedy assholes, which is a, which is a humanity flaw. It's not an American flaw. Mm -hmm. But also, oh, and... Team America World Police so takes that, that's a better example, takes this cliche and takes the ever loving piss out of it. Yeah. There's even a song dedicated to ripping apart a Michael Bay movie. America. No, not even. Yeah. I'm talking about uh, I miss you and Pearl Harbor sucked. Oh, that one. <laughs> I miss you like Michael Bay missed the mark when he made Pearl Harbor. <laughs> See that's an, and that's another example where they wrote original songs and they took the piss out of that too. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's so yeah, just jingoism, rah rah America stuff. Granted, ever since American nationalism left a bad, started leaving a bad taste in people's mouths over the last 
decade and a half or so, yeah. Hollywood's kind of toned it down considerably and pointed. They're more likely to point out American flaws than they are American heroism. So credit where credit's due, but from in the 80s and 90s, this cliche was everywhere. I mean, there's nothing wrong with loving your country, but to an extent... It's like, if, if humanity... No, no country is perfect. Exactly, yeah. 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 Um, so what's my next pick yeah. for this? Um, okay, okay, this I I've been seeing this a lot lately. Yeah. This is a very modern yeah. uh, cliche that I'm getting incredibly, incredibly tired of. Yeah. And no, it's not Mary Sue's. Calm down. I was. I, I almost was gonna talk. I about, almost talked about that too, but it, you know, can we talk about? Are you gonna talk about Gary Stews? No, no. I, I'm talking about fights in movies where no one lays a single fucking hit on anyone. Like it's always punch, punch, counter, counter, punch, punch, counter, 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 <laughs> jump, <laughs> punch. Oh, I blocked it. Oh, I blocked that. I blocked. It. It's like watching two kids saying, "Oh, I shot you." Yeah, well, I took that shit and reversed it. Now you're shot. No, uh, I have a super shield. That's literally what me and my friends did. <laughs> it's like on the playground. It's when like ninety-five percent of all Marvel movies. It's like I see a fight and it's just there's not enough. It's just two people who can absorb so much damage. I don't or, know, or, like or when made so much damage. It's when uh, Thanos, uh, when Thor threw Mjolnir at Thanos, and then he used Iron, Thanos used Iron Man as a human shield, and Iron Man goes flying and gets knocked out. I felt that, so it's well, I, I get what you're saying. A, yeah. I mean, yeah, but I'm not that. That's different. Yeah, because like I'm, I'm just saying, like in most movies I see nowadays, it's just like no one seems to get a hit, yeah. or no one seems to take a hit. It's just I, I never feel like they're wearing down. I never feel like they're in is exuberant. They're like exerting themselves. Is um. It feels like they're sleepwalking, basically. Is your boy Smith gonna come up in this example? Yes. <laughs> the, the worst example of this, I think. Evan, you probably haven't seen this movie. Ever heard of the movie Ultraviolet? Yes. With Mila Jovovich. I actually saw. I used to see TV spots Holy for that, and I thought fuck. this. Looks, I hate that movie. It looks like. Something that could have been good, but got hijacked by studio interference. Like, you and... want to talk about The Matrix or Smith. Like, Ultraviolet does a whole lot worse. Oh, yeah? Every single fight, she evades every hit and kills, like, 20 people. She walks into another room, kills 20 people. And there's even a part in the movie near the end where she just, like, she's surrounded and she just says, You're all gonna die. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Sure enough, they all die, and it just hard cuts, and she leaves the room with a room full of corpses. I'm like, man, if this movie didn't feel like five hours long, I feel like I would that would be a cute joke. But it's true. She hardly takes any damage, and it's mm. so boring. Yeah. And then there's, there's other examples. I didn't, like, Raya the Last Dragon kind of had this problem where he had the main character and the main villain. They're evenly matched almost to a hilarious degree, and they can't seem to, like... They just fight and fight and fight and fight, and they do it like ten times. Even Rise of Skywalker did that too, where Kylo Ren and Rey they fight and fight and fight. Uh, they uh, fight uh, and uh, fight. Only... They fight and fight and fight. Fight, 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 fight. It's annoying as fuck. <laughs> Although there was one point where Kylo did have the upper hand on Rey, and I did yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. But it's just like, um, it's annoying. I don't like it. And there's a lot of Marvel movies that do this, and then there's. The burly brawl from Matrix Reloaded. Dun, 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 dun. Which dun, is just ridiculous. Dun, 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 I love dun, 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 We've been mentioning the scene a lot, but it's like, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I kind of love it. It goes on for too and long. And I kind of hate it. Yeah, well, that kind of goes for a lot of fight scenes in Reloaded. Like, Neo doesn't take, like, any damage throughout most of that movie. No, like, he gets smacked on the face and they act like he, like... Uh, his brother and him are just squabbling over a toy, and they're just like, Whoosh. yeah, and he, it's, it's like nothing. It's it's ridiculous. I never feel any tension because he cheats. It oh, just and keeps going and going. If and Neo going. sends one Smith flying across the the, the park, like a, a ten more Smiths come at him. It's like a bunch of sponges bumping into each other. It's like yeah. there's no no gain, no nothing lost, nothing gained, yeah. and it's boring. I don't like action scenes like this. I mean, like you watch something like the raid. My God, oh. they have to fight for their fucking lives in those movies. It's insane. Way, I want more stuff like that. Now, uh, there, now, if I had good examples of this cliche, I mean, I mentioned Star Wars and the Matrix, sure. But the first the first Matrix movie, it's like, 
I feel like when Neo finally becomes the one and he like he's able to block almost everything and he can defeat enemies in a single punch, that's okay because he worked towards that. Yeah. There was a lot of fear also, for like the longest time. They had to contrast humanity with the simulation the yeah. and the machines. So that's the thing. For the the whole movie, it's almost like a game of Pac-Man. You're watching him being chased by these ghosts, these fucking agents that are yeah. almost under they're almost indefeatable. They're yeah. indes- not indefeatable, undefeatable, yeah. indestructible. So to see Neo finally get the upper hand, to finally see him kill a Smith, kill Agent Smith with a single blow, it's it, it's like ah, oh, yeah. huge relief. Yeah. But when you see that for a whole movie, it's boring. But I, I noticed you've been uh, when we were watching Reloaded a while ago. Yeah. You were calling the any agent you saw a Smith, and I didn't blame you because to quote him. The best thing about being me, there's so many me's. <laughs> oh, and then, oh, you, your favorite, the thing that made you, I didn't think this would make you laugh as hard as I did, but it's like an agent sees the burly brawl from the distance. He's about to intercept and it. And a smith goes, taps him on the shoulder. You. Yes. Me. <laughs> me, me, me. Me too. <laughs> We talked about that in the albums episode, but it's just, that's that that I died laughing. Yeah, <laughs> but okay. And then another another I talked about Star Wars earlier, but I don't mind when they're having a lightsaber fight and none of them are getting hit with the lightsaber, like they're deflecting at a pretty constant mm-hmm. rate because lightsabers are really lethal. Yeah, you can't survive getting hit with one well, of those. In every single every single lightsaber duel has some kind of consequence yeah i mean like there's, there's definitely exceptions like when when luke gets his hand cut off in empire strikes back or like anakin gets basically cut into pieces by oh, dooku and, even, and obi-wan it's like and yeah. even by and even then like when they're fighting on mustafar like they're getting like droplets of lava on yeah them. you can feel the heat and tension although i do feel that like much like burly brawl that scene kind of overstated that well went on too i because, love that movie but it did go on too like, long that phantom menace has a really good like lightsaber fight at the end and it's not without consequence because uh it yep. costs two people yeah yeah i mean they like they, there's some deaths to that but the thing is is like darth maul has a double-edged lightsaber you have to be very careful not to get hit by him yeah. <laughs> they don't, like they never seen anything like that that's a weapon that's wholly unique to him yeah so yeah Which, i like that fight well yeah yeah it's fine but i prefer fights where characters get tired, characters get really hurt, yeah. there's consequence, there's even times where maybe it's better we don't fight and we try to stay away. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I, I get so tired of fights yeah. that go on for too long, and there's not enough damage, and they're, they're just impervious to one another. It's like, it's like, it's like an immovable object against an unstoppable force, and it, yeah. it, it gets exhausting. Yeah. So I said my piece, let's move on. Okay, so um, this cliche that I'm going to talk about actually kind of takes the piss out of men, but I'm going to talk about another cliche that takes the piss out of women later on. So don't worry, ladies. Okay. I'll get to you. Okay. Okay. The next, <laughs> the next, um, the next uh, cliche I want to talk about was common in again, very big in the '90s and to a degree the 2000s. It was incompetent men risk at risk of losing their loved ones to another guy who is an even bigger piece of shit than they are like how many okay so in com this is this is very common in family films and comedies i need an example of this okay so it's a bit more clear so you remember liar liar where um jim carrey he's you know he keeps breaking promises to his kid and his wife and then they're gonna go off on they're gonna get on a plane and go away with this other guy who is always carol always who isn't much better than jim carrey is he's just a sleazy you know suave guy so automatically the their his family thinks oh that guy's good because my husband keeps lying and fumbling up i didn't really hate carrie always too too much in that well oh i'll give you especially like how he acted in the end oh but there's an i'll give you another example okay in ted uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, is, keeps slip, slip, he keeps flip-flopping with, uh, his honey, and her boss keeps uh, trying Joel to McHale, date her. Yeah. He is the biggest Chad piece of shit you'll ever see. <laughs> That's kind of like, like every uh, role but, but, but this is the plays, thing. Yeah. Like, the, oh, and, uh, this is a holiday movie, but Jingle All the Way, 
uh, Phil, yeah, Phil Hartman trying mm. to steal okay. the affections of Arnold's wife. So the the, guy, the, the slimy guy who kind of exactly. finesses his way into the other one. Yes. The, the, lo- the love one, yeah. Yeah. Now, okay, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so about. that's what I'm going like. Movies like Liar Liar. Oh, in 2000, I talked about Liar Liar, Ted are good examples of this. Oh, in 2012, we're rolling Emmerich. Uh, uh, that wasn't was, that his ex-wife? Yeah, no, they were all, he, he, he's a, he's a deadbeat ex-husband who, I guess, owes a shit ton of child support, and I don't understand what his character has to do with that story, he's just a common, a a schlub trying to keep his family that doesn't like him safe, which is admirable, but then, his, Uh, his, his, the the guy who replaced him, the ex-wife has a new husband, who is this overzealous plastic surgeon and the movie kind of takes the piss out of him by the way the thing i don't like about this cliche is so predictable the 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 wife Mm -hmm. or the love their loved ones are gonna see how much of a slime ball or how useless the the other guy they think they like is and that guy and and the divorcees will get back together or worse they will they'll either get back together or in 2012's case the the intruding the intruding gentleman John caller will just the, the intruding gentleman caller will just die like remember in uh and by the way the the, the new husband the like the stepfather in 2012 he gets grinded by the gears of a door like that yeah, wasn't that was, he didn't just die he really i don't think died. he really deserved that to be honest well when i saw that movie for the first time i kind of predicted he's gonna die he's isn't gonna, he? he's gonna die and like yeah he did die oh man um so what's a good example of this okay cliche? there are two examples that I think where this cliche is done right. Um, in Mrs. Doubtfire, you have Robin Williams gets divorced with Sally Field, and Sally Field goes on to date Pierce Brosnan. Ah, uh, yeah, Pierce Brosnan. But this yeah. is the thing. Pierce Brosnan isn't this over... He's, 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 a, a he's, he's a rich guy. He's smooth talking. He's very... It is very clear from the second he pops on screen that he, him and Sally Field used to date years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and it's communicated in their dialogue that they used to have a thing and they want to... And he might want to reignite the fire there. Yeah. And he almost does. But this is the thing. That guy, pompous, maybe, rich, definitely, extremely affectionate towards the kids where their father isn't. Yeah, which may, isn't a bad uh, thing. Maybe... Actually, no, wait, I scratched that. I made a mistake. That, the, the prop, that dad's father, the, the, that movie's problem was Robin Williams loved his kids so much that he was irresponsible in his professional life and he was irresponsible with his marriage. But that movie makes an irresponsible loving father into a responsible loving father. Now, the, the, the closest but thing... The, the, the movie doesn't paint his actions in the best light by the end of it. Like, you do see that, yeah, Robin Williams went too far. Yeah, he did. Well, the movie the says, yeah, these are, in in reality, yeah, these are very, like, unorthodox actions, and there would be legal ramifications oh, to yeah, it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, in, going back to Pierce Brosnan... He, he had a restraining order, right? No, it, it essentially was... His already shit custody agreement got even worse, and it's like now you can't see you could he could still see his kids, but supervised by a court liaison. That would yeah. suck. Now, yeah. in the case of Pierce Brosnan, in the movie, the closest thing he comes to being a do the closest he comes to being a douchebag is when he's talking at the country club with uh, this guy at the bar, and he's like, "Oh, I'm pushing forward. I don't want to spend the rest of my life by myself." Oh, what about their real their kid's real father? Oh, what can I say wrong? The guy's a loser. But like, that's not a douche. It's a it's an off putting thing to say. It's a rude thing to say. But he's not like Pierce Brosnan isn't a, a slick and slimy like douche who I like. I kind of I'm kind of happy that they're that his kids are with this guy. But and by the mm-hmm. way, um, I happen to know a lot about like the production of Mrs. Doubtfire. They originally wrote an ending where Sally Field and Robin Williams get back together, but they for they. They left it on a much more mature note, like, no, they're not going to get back together, but we are going to have the dad be able to see his kids. Yeah. Like, that was the best ending they could have. Because the divorcees getting back together, that is, that's almost a cliche in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. That's what, but, I, that's what I appreciate about the Ant-Man movies, actually. Yeah. Scott Lang doesn't get back with Judy Greer, but... He builds a better, you know, like a bit more of an amicable like relationship with Judy Greer, as well as her like, you know, her, yeah. her boyfriend played by um. No, that was her her new her new husband. Her new, her new husband, yeah, played yeah. by um. His name, his character's name was Paxton. I forget the uh, guy. Who his, him. his name escapes me at the moment, but yeah. I and, actually, I, I I think more movies could benefit from that kind of approach, where you have like a healthier, like 
I actually put that. I actually put your depiction of divorces. It's funny you mentioned Ant Man because I kind of put that down as an example for this cliche where because it's like Paxton, it like Paxton is a cop, and I understand that, but does he have like? He's he's treating this poor guy who just got out of jail. The guy Scott Lang did his time. Like he did it fairly. He he wasn't Bobby Cannavale. Bobby Cannavale. Yeah, Bobby Cannavale is treating Paul Rudd like shit. He he won't let him he won't let him anywhere near his his daughter. Despite the his fact that he just yeah. that he just got out of jail and and by the way, when uh it looks like Scott is going to have a run has a run in with the law thanks to Hope Van Dyne. Uh this guy, Paxton, is just talking down to him like crazy. It's like, oh, they were so, they were so happy that the, you were going to turn your, your life around, but they were wrong, and I was right. And uh. It's like, yeah, I get it. You're a cop, and you have principles, but you do realize that your principles are a little myopic there. Like, you're, you're treating a guy who served time like shit, and... I honestly, that's a societal stigma. Like, you try being yeah, an ex con and getting a job. Being an ex con and trying to get a job, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. It's not easy. Like, yeah. it's really hard. Yeah. But in the second movie, like, I, I actually, they're not in it for long, but, like, they're, they're, they're not, the animosity is, like, almost completely yeah. gone by that point. Well, he, he earned Paxton's, re- he, earned, he earned Paxton's respect because he, uh, yeah. saved, he saved Cassie. Yeah, it's not. Oh, I, mean, I, know, I, like, I, know. I like that group hug they have together. Yeah, that was cute. great. Oh, just for the, just a little side note. Um, I still cannot get over how gruesome a death Darren Cross died in Ant Man. Oh fuck! Like parts of his body shrank <laughs> incrementally. <laughs> oh, his his scream is burned into my head. Yeah, it was that was tough. That's the most gruesome MCU death before. But do you have any other good examples? Uh, a there? good example. Oh. Uh, I know we like to take the piss out of Happy Madison, but Click surprisingly has a good example of okay, because okay. Mike, because Adam Sandler in Click, he's a workaholic, and then he wakes up te- after he fucks with the remote too much. It fast forwards him ten years to the point where he's like missed out on ten years of his life, mm-hmm. and then he re- he sees his wife Kate Beckinsale is now married to Sean Astin, and yeah. it's like, um. And Sean Astin isn't a piece of shit. Sean, a- unlike his character in Fifty First Dates, <laughs> which I'll get yeah. to later, but um, in Click, Sean Astin's a decent guy. It's like mm. he's he's the father that was there when Adam Sandler wasn't. So in my and by the way, like there's even a scene where like he's on his de- Adam Sandler's on his deathbed and he's like, oh. he holds up a I, I the, the the gag has no dialogue, but he holds up a finger and it's like no, just kidding, you're okay and the guy's like yeah it's like you're gonna use your deathbed to do a joke about this guy it's like that that's funny but at the same time i I do appreciate rom-coms where like the guy who's like the rival to the main character in the the love interest is not like a total piece of garbage like oh so the opposite of ted yeah like uh i'll give you a good example the notebook I, I think James Marsden's character is a pretty fleshed out character. I still have not seen the Notebook. You haven't seen the Notebook? Well, James Although, Marsden, who I don't know why he always plays a cuckold in every movie, <laughs> even the Sonic movies. Well, I mean, I mean not that one, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, like, but like, poor Scott. Yeah, poor Scott Summers. Yeah, but anyways, it's just like um, in the Notebook, it's like Rachel McAdams could be happy with either James Marsden or Ryan Gosling. But she chooses, and while James Marsden's not happy with it, he accepts. Yeah. He's not, you know, bitter about it. Yeah. But it's just, like, I, I think, like, his character is a really good example of, like, a rival in a rom-com who's actually, like, not a scumbag, like, in most movies. Yeah. That, that the, in any other movie, he would be. Oh. But he's a pretty decent guy. You, you know want I mean? another example where the rival is a scumbag? The Vow with Channing Tatum and Rachel. Uh, I haven't watched that. I don't really watch those movies. I remember going... I was in film school when that came out on Valentine's Day weekend, and I went with my single friends to see it, and it was like, wow, like, this is... It's, it was okay, I mean, but yeah, yeah though, there was another bullshit. You, you remember Venom? <sighs> yeah, like, uh, Michelle Williams, she's with this other guy, I don't know who he is, but, like, 
Venom, uh, like the, like Tom Hardy kind of interrupts their date, I think, and he jumps yeah. in the lobster tank and all that. Uh, and you think he would just be written off at that point, but he actually does help Eddie like yeah, no, deal I like with the that. suit or whatever. Like I mean, he, he he still has a function in the plot beyond just being yeah. like an obstacle. That so movie liked, that I movie that. had problems, but I actually like that. So in other words, movies are getting a bit better with this trope. So yeah, that's a good example of it. But this was an old this this cliche. Like I said, this cliche was common in the nineties and. To, and part of the 2000s. But yeah. it's getting better. It yeah. is getting better. Next. All right, you want to talk about relationships. Okay, so this cliche is more in line with... It, it's more of a television cliche. Oh, yeah? I don't know if it's dying off or not, but you find this all the time in sitcoms, and that is the will-they-won't-they they relationship. <laughs> So no one told you the plot was gonna be this way. Ross and Rachel. <laughs> Ross and Rachel is the most frustrating thing I've ever seen. And I don't know why people like them so much. I think it's a toxic relationship that just really should not have been dragged on and off that often. Yeah. It's just frustrating to see, oh, Ross... The first season, you kind of root for him. It's like, oh, I kind of want him to get with Rachel. But, you know, it's probably not going to happen. And then at the end of the season, Rachel's like, oh, my God, Ross liked me this whole time? I better go tell him. Oh, no, he found another girl to be with who's perfectly fine in every way. But now Rachel's all jealous and mm. nasty to her for no reason. And then Ross and you know, they inevitably break up. And then, then, and then they finally get together, and it's like, oh, nice, okay, that was kind of early on, I hope nothing bad happens, literally the same episode, <gasps> you wrote a list about all the things you don't like about me, we are over, and Ross is like, oh, no, and then they work it out, and then it's like, uh, things are going kind of rocky, and they're in a bit of a rough patch, so, like, Rachel's like, I think we need a break, and so Ross kind of misconstrues the, you know, the, the parameters of a break because yeah. he's never had one. Mm -hmm. So he sleeps with someone while he's drunk and Rachel finds out and she gets wholly pissed off at him. And he's like, oh, for a whole season in the show, he just keeps saying, we were on a break. And it's like, shut up. <laughs> Everyone shut up. Okay. Monica and Chandler. Yeah. That's a better relationship. It starts off kind of like, eh, yeah. maybe I could be your boyfriend. It's like, ah, oh, you're not. Yeah, no. And then they sleep together. And it's like, oh, great. Now the ratings are going to spike. And they're going to milk this for all it's worth. But it's actually a way healthier relationship. I actually don't understand why people don't talk more about them when it comes, uh, as opposed to Ross and Rachel. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't, Friends I, is one. Friends is one of the few shows that everyone knows the names of the actors and everyone knows the names of their characters. That is true. You are right. I never just go, hey. So Matt LeBlanc is, you know that, you know when he did that thing. So he's like, hey, you know when Joey says, hey, how you doing? It's like, yeah, yeah you know, they're pretty well connected. Well, with compare their that to How I Met Your Mother. Like, do you, do Neil you Neil Patrick Harris, Neil Patrick Harris, uh, Jason Siegel, uh, Colby Smolders, Colby Smolders, and the band camp girl from American Pie. <laughs> Uh, uh, Allison Hannigan, I guess. Allison Hannigan, I, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I never watched that show, so I can't use that as an example. Well, if you want to get into, like, a, a debate about sitcoms, the, 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 the Friends purists despise How I Met Your Mother because they think How I Met Your Mother is just Friends. And are, I don't are, care either way. <laughs> But, no, I've wa uh, I've watched How I Met Your Mother more than I've watched Friends, but I I see the differences. Yeah, I, I yeah. see the similarities too. Yeah. Um, another one, uh, you know, Big Bang Theory with the whole Leonard and Penny thing. Yeah, where it's about it's neuro like this, this... neurotypical guys trying to you know score neuro really, really... no neurodiverse guys trying to score like a really women. nerdy guy gets with a hot girl. And it's like I don't that's, know what they people see think in each that other. that's a cliche that people talk about too. And they sleep together, and then they break up, and then they get together again, and then they break up, and then I they feel... see other people, and they get jealous with each other, and it's that, awful. To be fair to the Big Bang Theory, I feel like that's more in tune with how it would actually go in real life. I guess because in a movie, it's still in a movie when in a movie when a nerdy guy gets the girl, you assume they live happily ever after, but what you don't see is like how their relationship functions in the long run. But it's a, but man, I wonder if they'll oh. get married in the end I, oh they do i thought of an i thought of an mm. example that's okay you, i think your cliche is very prevalent prevalent pre prevalent in movie in no in tv shows 
But in a movie, uh, would you consider the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy uh, a will they, won't they romance? Yep. Because <laughs> that's a good example. Peter and Mary Jane. Yeah. Jesus good Christ. Lord. Like he 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 spends the fir- the whole, the entire first movie. I love Mary Jane so much. I wish I could be with her. Oh, she loves me too. Oh, I can't because great power. Yada yada yada. Oh, in the movie. Oh. I sort of love her. Oh, she has a boyfriend. I really love her. And she hates me because I'm late for everything. Oh, wait, she loves me? Oh, my God. We can finally be together. Nope. Spider-Man 3. I'm going to marry her. Oh, but uh, she gets fired from her play. And I'm uh, obsessed with how great my life is as Spider-Man. And I don't care about her troubles. Mm -hmm. And I'm overzealous. Also, I'm going to get... My mind warped by a symbiote. I'm and gonna I'm, punch her. I'm gonna hit her in the face. And yeah. then we're just gonna hug it out like it never happened. Yeah. It's like Peter. <laughs> Peter, with all that going on, you had Ursula right there, man. All along. And Gwen. She, she got you a piece of cake, man. And a glass of Wait. milk. Okay, so I know I give sitcoms a bad rap. I did a whole last. I did a whole last straw on it. But I'll give you a good example of an on again, off again relationship. Yeah. That's done in a way that actually makes sense. Jim and Pam from The Office. Uh, I, I've heard of this. I, I have not seen very much of The okay, Office. Okay, so I'll give you the lowdown. We're talking about the, the American Office. Not uh, the yeah, movie. yeah, the American Office. Yeah, so Jim develops feelings for Pam, who's a receptionist. So they, they, they're, they're like pretty tight friends. She always goes along with all of his pranks against Dwight and all that. And and uh, Jim's with uh, Amy Adams, you yeah. know, and um, uh, Pam is with uh, I forget his name. I forget the name of his character, yeah. but it doesn't really matter. He's like a, he's like you know he, he works at a warehouse. He's kind of a gruff guy. Yeah. And uh, the thing of it is, is like Jim develops more feelings for Pam, but that she's getting engaged with the other guy, mm. and um, Pam is getting kind of mixed signals. So. There's times where they kind of flirt with the idea, but you, but Jim keeps getting rebuffed, and it's like, oh, and he doesn't know what he wants because he knows it's an awkward situation. Yeah. But eventually, um, it starts coming through very slowly, and he keeps trying to lay hints, and Pam eventually starts to notice, and at first she's a little flabbergasted, mm-hmm. but she kind of starts liking Jim, too? Yeah. And it's very awkward because she's engaged, right? Right, yeah. But eventually, eventually, uh, her fiance finds out, yeah, and it gets ugly, oh, and and boy. and Pam just wants to get the hell out of there. And there's one point where like the guy almost assaults Jim, but then Dwight, yeah. who, who who just takes a can of bear mace and sprays the guy, and yeah. it's just like I, you know after that falls apart, they start seeing each other, and sometimes it, it sometimes it doesn't always work, but it, it's a it's a pretty healthy relationship. Mm. And they're both they 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 bring out the best out of one another, yeah. and um, it it work it works out, and they get married, and they have yeah. children, and even the guy who she was engaged with yeah. gets married and is is happy. So yeah, that's one case. And oh, and uh, one thing I love, Evan, when they get together, mm. they stay together. Ah. There's none of this flip flopping. There's none of this. Oh, the ratings are gonna tank if they stay together. We have to add some unnecessary drama. Yeah. Like, they'll have a fight, you know, yeah. like all couples do. But they resolve it healthily. Yeah. Or he- I mean, in a healthy manner. Yeah. And um, you, What you're talking about is actually, it ties into another cliche that I'm going to talk about later. Yeah. But And I guess Skinner and Krabappel from The Simpsons are kind of a good example where <sighs> they don't really know what they want. And sometimes they like each other, and other times uh, Skinner is just <sighs> too tied to his mom, and it gets but annoying. it takes, no, it, if it took place over the course of a couple seasons... That'll be fine, and it get, and it never comes up again. Why the hell does it have to take fourteen years to amount to something and then get dropped? But then, oh, and th- I can't. Get, yeah, that that wedding episode sucks. I can't. Oh, uh, uh, sp- uh, my big fat geek wedding. Yeah, uh, where she marries comic book guy. Almost marries comic book guy comic instead. Guy. But uh, well, we scared. can't we can't rag on that too much because uh, keep in mind, uh, Harry Shearer uh, is alive, but. Um, Marcia Wallace uh, no longer sadly is. passed, passed away, in so. circa 2013. And at so. least she was happier with Ned. Yeah. You know, take some solace in that. Right. But I feel like I've rambled on enough about this topic. Let's move on to your next cliche. My next cliche that I want to talk about is that I don't have a whole lot to say, but it's just something I noticed when I was a kid. 
in family films, the bully kids become friends with their victims. This cliche I noticed was very common. Like, but there are so many times, there are a lot of the time it was done right, but the worst example that I could think of was, have you seen the movie Like Mike? No. Okay. Like Mike, uh, I kind of, in order to understand, uh, I'm not going to recreate the plot for you, but the, the, the basic premise is this. There's little Bow Wow and Jonathan Lipnicki are friends at an orphanage, and their bully is played by a very young Jesse Plemons. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so... At this orphanage, uh, like uh, little Bow Wow discovers these shoes with the initial, these sneakers with the initials MJ, and uh, th- Jordan, they yeah. were told, "Oh, they belong to a great about some basketball player." And then he he wears the shoes, and all inexplicably, they were struck by lightning or something, and he gets the pow- the basketball prowess of Michael Jordan, and he actually gets a contract to play with an NBA team, and so it's like you know the little kid that could, and. Yeah, it'd be the, a dream come now, true. Now, there's corruption at the orphanage. At first, the bully kid likes him for the fact that he has this new magical power, which, that's another toxic message. The bully kids will stop bullying their victims once the kids do something that either saves the world or does something so extraordinary. Not every kid that gets bullied is going to be able to do something extraordinary that will get their bully to stop bullying them. And I got news for you. Even if you do do something extraordinary, but let's say you win a school spelling bee... Your bully's not going anywhere, kid. Sorry. Yeah, most of the time they just kind of go their separate ways. Can I be? Oh, there. This just to give a real life example. There was this kid that my friend actually wrote a speech about Sidney Crosby, and one of the kids at our school who was known for being a bully actually chewed him out. One is like, yeah, you know, Sidney Crosby was a crybaby. Yeah, the bully. That bully was just salty that he didn't make the finals. But that's my point. Bullies don't just go away when their victims do something extraordinary. It's a little more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the reason why I brought up Like Mike is because there is another... Later in the movie, there is a subplot with how corrupt the orphanage director is, and the orphanage director is played by Crispin Glover. There is a scene where, to get a piece of information, they take Jonathan, the Jesse Plemons with his with his uh, disciples. Take They take... Jonathan Litnicki hostage, and the the orphan the evil orphanage director takes a lighter to the picture of the kid's deceased mother, and it's like if you don't give me what information I want, I'm gonna light this, and you're never gonna have your mom's picture ever again. Like that's holy, holy fuck, that's man. fucking evil, Jeez. and it's like, and then at the end of the movie, uh, little Bow Wow wins the championship, and then Jesse Plemons is like casually talking to him on the playground as if that evil shit like f- taking orders from the evil orphanage director never happened it's like no that's the worst that's the worst i i don't recall ever seeing him uh, this cliche done that badly um instances where it was an instance where it was kind of done right was in airbud like plot of airbud movie i haven't seen the, the plot of airbud it, it was a it was a late 90s kind yeah, of a I, I know kind of a formulaic about, sports but, movie but go on so there's a bully kid who is on the basketball team, but then the kid gets kicked off, and then he goes to play for the rival team. How easy is that in real life, by the way? He he go he he. You're gonna move an entire town just to get back at this kid you're bullying. Like, you, oh, his dad was an asshole in that movie too. The, the bully's mm-hmm. dad was also a prick too. But in Airbud, like in the big final basketball game. Uh, the main character like scores the winning basket, and then the bully character goes, "Hey, water boy, nice shot." Like the kid doesn't become his friend; he just gives him a nice compliment. That is realistic, so I'll give him that. Another example where I thought the cliche was done well was in Moonlight. I mean, granted, the bully character starts off as his friend and then betrays him, and then later, when they're adults, they reconnect in a coffee shop, and it's really emotional. But, yeah, that's when I thought the cliche was done right. So, uh, not a whole lot to say about that cliche. I, I'm surprised you haven't brought up, like, Nelson Muntz or oh, Binky I was just, Barnes. I was just getting to that. Be- well, I find them very similar, Nelson actually. Muntz and Binky Barnes are examples of a bully character that becomes friends in the with, with his victims in the right way. Because mm. the episode that solidifies uh, Binky as a bully and Nelson as a bully... So, in the context of Arthur, bully for Binky, uh, Sue Ellen, who is the new girl, doesn't understand how much of a piece of shit Binky is. So, 
she cha- she stands up for herself when no one else is is wants to stand up for themselves in front of Binky, and she actually challenges Binky to a fight. And Binky, when Binky finds out that she knows Taekwondo, she he keeps coming up with excuses to avoid the fight, and then eventually he finds a way to become friends with Sue Ellen, and in turn becomes a frenemy of the other kids. And in the case of Bart the General, that shows Nelson Muntz. By the way, that episode, I mentioned this on our Simpsons episode, Bart the General is the one episode that portrays Nelson Muntz as, like, a terrifying force of nature. Like, I feel for Bart. Like, I believe Bart is getting bullied by this kid. But how they get back at Nelson is fun to watch, and how they resolve it, it's like, okay. Of course, granted, Nelson is still a bully throughout the show, but he has, like, a frenemy relationship yeah, with Bart. That's interesting. Sometimes he tags along, other times he can be a bit of a dick. Yeah. He he kind of splits off from the regular group of bullies like Jimbo and Kearney and yeah. uh, Dolph. Though. Which is exactly what happens to Binky in the longevity of Arthur, too. Yeah, they're very, very similar, actually. Yeah. Although... That's why I brought him up. Well, Binky grow, gr- has a grows up in a well... in a well off home and a well-off lifestyle nelson months grows up in poverty so yeah, yeah. wrong side of the tracks kind of deal yeah binky is just a dick for this because i feel like binky's size and muscle gets to him and so he thinks he can just push people around with that mm-hmm. but yeah no that's an example wasn't there also an episode where he bullied everyone over a clarinet i talked about that in the arthur episode i, I love that. that i love that episode because it it brilliantly showcases how much of a bully binky can be while simultaneously showing how brilliant he is yeah like there's like a soft undercurrent to him that he yeah. doesn't always like to show yeah there's like an, an interior to him that he shows some depth and yeah tenderness yeah yeah so yeah bullies that become friends with their victims too easily Tell me, like, amazing it- spider-man didn't they do that with flash like, he was a dick, but then in the end of the movie, he kind of respected Peter a bit more. That's, yeah. And the, like, when and his th- uncle got shot. Yeah, well, he, he did some... That was done relatively well, too. I didn't I, I didn't really understand how Peter and Flash... As soon as, like, he Peter attempts to have a normal high school life, why are him and Flash best friends all of a sudden? Yeah. But I, but I think the reason for... I think they were paying homage to the comics where it's like, Flash hates peter parker but loves spider-man mm-hmm. so it's like i think that th- di- that dichotomy was done a lot better in the mcu yeah where the flash kid is like he's like a pretentious social media influencer and the second he finds out peter parker's spider-man he pret- he writes a whole fucking book <laughs> on how like, they're best friends it's like fucking flashpoint what a hack <laughs> like he's the jake paul of the mcu <laughs> seriously <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Fuck funny. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right, uh, should I go on to my next? Yes. One, if yeah. I may. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is a cliche I actually vehemently dislike. Actually, these next two are ones I vehemently dislike, but this one I have a lot more to say about. Yeah. Um. Okay. It technically falls under the Deus Ex Machina trope yeah. of writing, yeah. but I hate it when a character. You know, he's getting kicked in the ass by the villain. The villain has the upper hand. And then out of nowhere, some guy just shoots him from behind. Yeah. And the villain gets killed. Yeah. I hate that cliche. Yeah. It's just, it feels so unearned for yeah. the most part. And uh, the, the the biggest example I can think of is Star Wars Rogue One. Oh. Jen Ursa. She's, like, she's on the top of the big tower thing. And General Krennic. Director Krennic. Director Krennic. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, he's like the uh, the, the principal from the Breakfast Club. The bad guy from Ready Player One. Uh, Nolan ben, Sorrento. Ben Mendelsohn, who I like as an actor. Yeah, he's. Great. I didn't like him in that movie, but everything else I saw afterwards, I was like, I like this actor. I like him in everything. Yeah. Did you like him in The Dark Knight Rises? Oh yeah, I forgot he was in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't notice him until Star Wars Rogue One. So yeah. then I went back. It's like, oh yeah, there you are. But anyways. Uh, I digress. So, yeah. General Krennic, who's re- director Krennic? Fuck the guy who's responsible for her mother, her mother's death, her father's death, uh, wiping out her whole life and like making her into who she is. You think? Yeah. You know what? I want her to face this, face down this asshole and kick him to the curb. I want her to fight him. And then he, I don't even remember what how the scene perspired. Like, I don't know what kind of fight. He has the upper hand, right? Yeah. And then Diego Luna, 
it comes out of fucking nowhere and shoots him from behind. And that pissed me off so much. That's not his job. She should have had the right to do that. She should have beat him up or killed him or whatever. But Bel instead... Believe it or not, uh, that movie suffered from development problems up the ass. I was going to say, because isn't there a scene in the trailer where a TIE fighter flies the, the original, that tower? The, the final fight, Jin Erso was supposed to fight a TIE fight, a guy in a TIE fighter. Yeah. And it was supposed to be like, you know... How Luke took down the AT AT in Empire Strikes Back, but okay. it, it was just like it, it would have been worse than okay, what they actually did. Yeah, I guess did. that scene must have been cut to. Speaking of uh, Cassie like and Andor, can you believe he's getting his own spinoff show on Disney? Uh, I couldn't give less of a fuck. I didn't like him. Yeah, I didn't like most of the characters in Rogue One. Didn't they do that? They did that in Iron Man Three too, with uh, Kill Aldrich Killian. It's like oh, I am the Mandarin. Fuck, you're right, and then. I hated that I, scene. I remember, yeah, you, you, you look like, I looked over at you and it's like, I am the Mandarin! And you I wanted was, to die. I'm like, shut the fuck up, white boy. And then, and then fucking Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> takes him out. <laughs> Just kills him, yeah, I hated that. Pepper, Pepper Potts. That's a so. better example of what I'm talking about. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. For a movie I actually sat through. <laughs> but okay, okay, I don't want to, I, I digress. I've yeah. been shitting on the MCU a lot. Yeah. There's some good examples of this cliche. Yeah. One good example is Dread. Right. Remember the scene where Dredd's like overpowered by two rogue uh, uh, judges and one of them gets killed, but then there's one that remains and it's like, guy last words and he said, wait, <laughs> the judge Dredd is asking me, begging me to wait before I kill him? That's hilarious. Why would you possibly do that? And then Olivia thoroughly shoots him to death <laughs> and he's like, Ugh! And, I just, he and just Dredd's like, I just want you to wait for her to shoot you. I'm like, yes, I like that. I like that, too, because it's like, oh, a diversion. That's Love great. It. And there's a scene in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark during that big bar fight where, like, there's that one guy who's about to shoot Andy, and Andy just kind of waits, he's ready to get killed, but then the guy's just like, <gasps> and My, blood that's spills out of his mouth, just, and Marion just Just to him. show how good an actor Harrison Ford is, like, uh, he... As soon as he hears a gun go off, he grabs his chest and thinking he's been shot. He's like, no, oh, what? Oh. Oh, Marion killed him. Yeah. See, I don't mind it if it's like some random lackey. Yeah. You know, I don't care because, you know, you know, it's kind of early in the movie. Oh, I know the main Another example of this cliche, when this cliche was done right, um, there's a, in Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, when Jack and Barbosa are going at it. Barbosa attempting to add some stakes to the fight, he points his pistol at Elizabeth and then... Jack, and then you don't see anything, and then you hear a pistol go off, and Elizabeth shakes. You think she's been shot, and then Barbosa notices a hole in his chest, and he says, Ten years you carried that pistol, now you waste your shot. And then Will's like, Oh, Jack didn't waste it, and he drops the, the curse gold and breaks the curse, and then Barbosa died. I, I feel cold. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, See, like that was that. done right, That's too. That's another good example. Yeah, I yeah. feel like those two are very similar. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, it, it, it has to be earned, and it has to... It, I, I hate it when it feels cheap. Yeah. Because I, I, I feel like it's done so, so many times in films. Just to add some tension. Just to make it seem like the character uh, mm -hmm. is about to die. Okay, so, the next cliche I want to talk about is... This, this, remember how I said... Ladies, remember how I said I was going to talk about a cliche that takes the piss out of your, out of your gender? Um, stalkerish behavior being rewarded with romance or sex. Now, mm -hmm. granted, this is kind of a non-issue in movies these days, thanks to the Me Too movement. But for a very long time, this in co comedies had really bad either A plots or B plots, where a dude would be literally creeping a woman and. At the end, or at some point, the woman would reward him with either sex or uh, with sex or a relationship. Uh, two really bad examples that come to mind are from the movies Crazy Stupid Love, which I actually really like. Is a, that's one of the better rom coms that's been made in the last twenty years. But there's a there is a subplot in Crazy Stupid Love where this thirteen year old kid in eighth grade has the hots for his babysitter who is a high school student who's like a good oh, no. a good three four years older than him and he keeps 
writing her really creepy messages saying, I want you, I love you, you're my soulmate. And then she, mm. from the first interaction, she's like, Bobby, please stop. I think her kid's name was <laughs> can Bobby. You, can you like, not? Like, Bobby, can you not? Like, it's making me, unco- this makes me uncomfortable. And, but this is the thing. He doesn't fucking stop. He, he says, he even says, I'm not giving up. Like, I've been that guy who doesn't give up. It's not good behavior. So, like, and granted, he's a kid, so this this isn't the worst example, but it's still pretty bad. He's a kid, so it's kind of sort of understandable. Mm-hmm. But this is where I don't what I don't like. I don't mind the fact that he's a kid. That's okay. But what I where, where I draw the line is at the end of the movie when all the storylines get resolved. This girl comes up to the kid and literally gives her gives him a nude Polaroid. It's like to get you through high school. Oh. It's like. Wow. You, this kid did nothing to earn that. He was being a creepy, over, overly romantic, stalkerish perv to this poor girl. This girl who's older than him, old enough to be his big sister, like, for the whole movie. And she gives him a Polaroid of her naked body. Sorry, I don't, that, yeah. no. Yeah. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of teen comedies that reward that kind of behavior. I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's on Netflix. It's, it's called Tall Girl. Oh uh, no, I haven't. It's all about a movie where a girl hates the fact that she's like the tallest girl in the school, and that's the and that's the drama. Mm. That's the gist. Now, but there's a weird kid who like keeps kind of like hounding her. He's like, I like you. I now, like you. I don't care. I don't care. And then he gets a milk crate at the end of the movie. He stands on it. And it's like I've always liked you, and she kisses him. This kid in this kid in Crazy Stupid Love does the same thing with it. He does. Yeah. He pulls a big. He goes to her high school and he pulls a big ass stunt. Didn't like, uh, I've never seen this movie. You ever seen Pretty in Pink? I have not, so we can't talk. Isn't about there? It. Isn't there like a character named Ducky who like gets the girl despite being know. an asshole and a weirdo? Well, great. you want to talk? Oh, another movie that I com- that completely escaped me, but it's just coming. We've been watching these very recently, but uh, Stifler in those American Pie movies. That guy gets lucky. Okay, granted, he gets the piss taken out of him, and he eats literal shit, like, from mm-hmm. time to time. But Stifler's behavior goes unpunished, with the ladies, goes unpunished Yeah, he does, too get, often. He does get the girl, despite okay. sh- bad behavior. Finch hooking up with his mom is meant to be his big jerk's comeuppance. N- that's not the worst it's thing. It's happened happen. several times at this point. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he just needs to get on with it. Yeah. So, but you no, know, but like, he fucking treats in American Wedding. He treats like the the one of the the bride's sister like an object, like a piece of meat. The whole movie, and then they're making out at the end. It's like, yeah, because Stifler saved the wedding that he ruined. But Evan, he's the most popular character this series. I don't I think. fucking I don't care. Know. I don't. I don't really know. And I don't understand why guys consider Stifler a role model. Yeah. It's like it's like the Barney Stinson effect. I mean I mean no, Barney Stinson, to his credit, has more class. Oh, easily, yeah. Stifler like, is just a piece of shit. He's t- he's bad, yeah. Yeah. But you know, you know, times change too. Like yeah. back in those days, if you're that kind of alpha male kind of douche, that 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 got the girls. He was the thank, bad boy. Well, thank you, super bad, for turning that on its head. Yes. yes. Now a movie that came, the worst example that I, where an adult, not a high schooler, an adult did this, My Super Ex-Girlfriend. Now, this is one of those movies Bad. where I'm not too crazy about it, but every time I tell you about it, you're like, I do not want to watch this movie. Uh, the whole idea is there's a superhero played by Uma Thurman, you know, your girl Mia, <laughs> and she, Luke Wilson is this schlub who discovers her secret identity, and so they have to date, but the Luke Wilson's best friend is Rain Wilson, not related. <laughs> Rain Wilson, there's this whole B plot the entire movie. Rain Wilson keeps uh trying to pick up this bartender who repeatedly turns him down. She's like, "Stop talking to me." But she fucking sleeps with Rain Wilson at the end of the movie as soon as she discovers that Rain Wilson knows the guy banging the the superhero. What the fuck? <laughs> like that wouldn't even that would not happen. Even MCU mm. standards, that would not happen. Yeah. So that's the worst example I can think of. Now, 
to I was I first I had a really hard time. There are not many examples where this cliche is done right, but I did think of one. Okay. Fifty first dates. It's oh okay. I haven't it's seen this one yet. Fifty first dates. Okay. He initially starts by he starts by genu- having a genuine connection with this girl, but as soon as she discovers that she has short term memory loss, he disco- he he goes into like a ground Adam Sandler goes into like a Groundhog Day principle where it's like, oh, I can do different things every day and get away with it because she won't remember who I am. Yay! But then her dad her his her dad catches him in the act and says, Yo, when you're done pulling that crap on my daughter, come by the house. So he discovers like how much of like the family's life is structured around keeping her from having a nervous breakdown. And the reason why I say this mo- he yes, he does stalk her and he does hijinks to get her himself to reintroduce himself that's in the first half of the movie in the second half of the movie when she has her big breakdown and realizes that she is her her condition is causing her to miss out on like the world evolving around her she when she that happens adam sandler is an incredibly supportive figure and he he isn't sleazy he's a genuinely good person like i I know adam sandler can play a douche in movies a lot of the time but that's one of the move that's one of the few happy madison flicks where he starts off a douche and actually has an arc a good a decent arc at the end okay so like the persistence just kind of shows the persistence actually pays off in a healthy way where he's not and it's not like stifler where he's a complete dick the whole he's not doing it for the wrong reasons he's He's not doing no he does it because he he genuinely cares about this person and there's a reason why he has to be persistent exactly you know she she often forgets about him no often she forgets about every every sleep cycle she her memory wakes up thinking it's the same day Mm -hmm. so so it's like a take on the time it's like no it's like it's like an inverted version of Groundhog Day where everyone in her life is reliving her day to make her ha- comfortable, but she has no clue that she's reliving the same day over and over again. Mm. But once she she discovers the incons- the discrepancies, it's like, oh shit, I am because of my memory loss. <clears throat> so that's, so yeah, stalkerish behavior being rewarded with either romance or sex, that's one cliche that I cannot stand and but... thankfully isn't a problem anymore. Yeah. What's next? All right, I guess this is like technically my last one because there, I feel like we could go on. And there's tons of cliches, I but mean, I, yeah. I'm literally just thinking about like comment below if you would like a cliches volume two. Maybe Cody will join us for the next one or that, something. That that would be nice. Yeah. yeah, give us more time to ruminate and think of more cliches. Yeah, but uh, okay then. Yeah, I'll wrap this up in my last cliche. This is one that I see an awful lot in animated movies. Oh. Specifically, back in the two thousands, mm. I saw this one an awful lot, and that is the liar revealed. Oh lordy! I never... I know I, I know two movies off the top of your head where you, that you were gonna talk. I about. never liked this cliche when even when I was a kid, I always thought it tainted every movie where it was like present. The biggest example for me would probably have to be A Bug's Life. I thought you were going to go with Shark Tale. That's my second one. Okay. A Bug's Life, which looking back on it, okay, when I was a kid, I never liked this. This this cliche always appears at the second act low point, right? It's like, oh, he, he's hiding something from the, the authority and, you know, they're going to get busted sometime. But, hey, they're having fun. Everything's working out. It'll, it'll be okay. Oh, no. There's the, the, the cat's out of the bag. And now everyone hates him for lying, and now the plan's ruined, and yeah, it's horrible. Thankfully, in Bug's Life, it doesn't last too long. Well, the other side of that cliche is after they 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 met, he he's hated by his peers, but then it's like, oh, I'm gonna do something that saves everything and everyone. So the bird worked. It did. Kinda, well, kind of, sort of, not really. It well, that, they the bird was a lie too. So you got t- the, the 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 bird was a was a fake, and as soon as Hopper figures it out, that's a lie revealed trope in itself. But the ants couldn't. I I kind of that I would actually I I'm going to be the contrarian to your point. But a bug's life, I'd actually say use it. A bug's life starts off by using the lie reveal trope the the usual way, but then. It shows that you can't scare off the grasshoppers with a fake. You, they have to. The, the bird had to fail so that Pixar could. The writers at Pixar, whom are brilliant, 
could write in the whole arc where the ants discover their humility and they discover and they stand up for themselves. And they, they, they get an inner. They feel empowered to fight back against the grasshoppers. Yeah, and I, I love and that. Spe- I I do like that. Yeah. The ending of like I had all the second act low point shit out of the way. The ending of A Bug's Life holds up a lot better than I remember when I was yeah. younger. Yeah. It's just like that painful wince inducing moment where you have to see Flick be down on himself yeah. and he, he, everyone in the colony hates him. I mean, they kind of hate him always throughout he, most of the he's movie. The, he's the weirdo who fucks everything. He is the reason that the con- the movie's conflict exists. Yeah. yeah. Flick's not the best Pixar protagonist. I mean, he's flawed. There, he's a flawed protagonist. Yeah, he is. Yeah, God bless him. <laughs> but um, yeah, you mentioned it earlier. Shark Tale is another fucking example where it's like, oh, he slayed the shark, quote unquote. I don't. Okay, I don't have a problem that it's a lot. Of, I the problem I have with this is everyone he, he, fucking believes him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he rolls with it. For most of the movie, like, was that it? Was that supposed to be like a really bad satire on how you know our paparazzi laced culture will just mindlessly believe whatever it's told? Maybe. Yeah, I guess. Jesus. Well, it's bad. Like, no one's good. okay. What what would it could have made Shark Tale a good movie is if there was like a villain character, not the sharks who are co- who are constantly ch- who are trying to expose oscar for the fraud that he is that yeah. that that or if lenny like totally ob- didn't just go along with the charade and actually was like yeah i know what you're doing is wrong like that's my brother yeah. you're lying about i mean over the hedge kind of has this cliche too oh with like uh the raccoon and all that yeah. and like the the turtle sees right through him but everyone else that was like, a by the way that was like a bug's life done over like i have to i'm a guy who is who is bullied by a bigger animal and i have to collect food for bigger animal or my ass is grass hmm hmm yeah hmm yeah are we sure ants is the only movie that ripped off bug's life mm. funny enough i prefer Ant- ants i prefer ants oh, over bugs easily life. well ants yeah. is more clever i like ants yeah and Ant- although here's the thing ants um when I think of the color palette for ants, I think of one or two colors. When I think of the color palette for a bug's life, I think of many yeah, colors. Yeah, bug's life is more for kids, but ants, I, I like how adult ants it is. De- ants depicts probably the closest representation to how an ant colony would look. If oh, easily. For most of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay, so I've said enough bad about this cliche. Yeah. I think the movie that uses cliche the best, Yeah. Mulan. Yes! Absolutely. She has to pretend to be a man to get into the army so that her father doesn't have to needlessly die to, to serve his country because he's too old. Yeah. And, like, he has, she has to do it. Also, he has a wound and he can't even yeah, wash he's no he's no good in a battle. He would easily get slaughtered. So she's doing it to protect her family. And um, the whole movie, it's like it's there's a lot of tension. It's like, oh, she has to, she's 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 having a little bath in the lake. Oh no, guys are there. She, they'll find out if she's too close to them. Well, do you want to know? Okay, in in ancient China, yes, there's a reason why she has to do this too. No, okay, it's in every other lie revealed story, oh, if the lie gets revealed, the characters hated. In this story, if her lie gets revealed, she's killed. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's to uh, quote Mushu. So he my word, cause if the army finds out your girl, the penalty is death. <laughs> I'm killing yeah. the microphone. Sorry, sorry we're, guys. We're, we're very passionate about this topic. Yeah. Clearly. yeah, but yeah, you're right. Um, the other it was a big societal issue too. Like women weren't allowed to fight in war, yeah. and Mulan um had to she had to prove herself too. It's not as simple as pretending to be a boy. She has to measure up to these men. Which is something she's not physically capable of doing, which is why yeah. she has to rely on other means to like be as good as them so, without revealing her secret. One might say, uh, sh- they made a man out of her. What's even better is that after her secret is revealed, um, you think that's the end. You think that's the end. You think she's done, game over. But no, she goes out of her way to get back, get to like the the big city. To like prevent the the rest of the Huns from uh, invading the and capturing the the emperor, and what ends up happening is in order to get into the temple, or not the temple, into this you know into the big the you know, palace the palace. Thank you, I was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. In order to get in, she has to have the men dress up like women 
<laughs> kind of like what she had to do throughout most of the and movie. I, and I thought that was brilliant, brilliant. because it's like oh. they, they they when they look like uh, concubines, ugly concubines. Yeah, like they did rest like geishas. It, it remi- no, it, it reminded me of remember when Mulan, you know, was rejected by the local matchmaker because she was clumsy or something. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, so essentially, I love how the guys. Had to go to that painstaking effort to look like those por- those picture perfect porcelain dolls, and they had to bring honor to us all. Uh, Mulan is a fantastic movie. It is. it is is the best example of this cliche done right. Another one, another movie. How'd I you guess... feel about the remake? Cody and I talked about this. Uh, Evan, we have, we've never heard your take on the remake. Let's uh, hear it, Evan. Uh, Mulan twenty whatever. That is not a film. What that is, is it? Not a movie. That is uh what happens when you you glaze your eyes and stare at a screen for over 2 hours. I don't I never care about what's going on. Every scene that was done so much better in the original is just so like it it is a flat line of an experience. I felt nothing. I remember at one point I said, "All right, I'm out." I I went in my room for 20 minutes. I stepped ba- I stepped back out. I was like, "Evan, did I miss anything?" And you're like, "No." <laughs> And I didn't, I didn't feel any different. Yeah, it is probably the worst Disney movie I've ever seen. Wow! I never want to watch it Worse again. Worse than Home on the Range. No, because I felt something <laughs> when I watched Home on the Range. I got wow. nothing out of Mulan 2020. It is a nothing burger of a movie, and I hate the behind the scenes facts that I read about it because it makes me hate the movie even more. Yeah, you know, um. Why is Disney cozy up to a government that is doing something really unethical? Because they want the fucking China bucks. Oh, That's man. all they care about nowadays. It's annoying. Mm. It's horrible. The amount of the amount of skull diggery they have to do for certain movies just so that it passes by their censorships yeah. is horrible. Yeah. Back to the liar reveal cliche. Uh, the one time I remember one movie that did it, and it was like Madagascar. You remember when they meet the lemurs? And they think they're the New York Giants. They're like, yo, protect us, freaks. Yeah. And then it turns out that, I don't know, they're not Hey, wait giants. a minute. But wait, that, wait. What matters most is that even though they got revealed, it didn't really matter. Wait, 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 wait. Are you saying that a, a tribe or colony of tiny life forms is being bullied by larger life forms and then even bigger life forms come along? Wow, DreamWorks just went back. What, DreamWorks, why did you rip off a Bug's Life in, like, several of your movies? Yeah, yeah. but the difference is, compared to, like, a Shark Tale and Over the Hedge, like, they're they're kind of over and done with it. Yeah. And, like, the lemurs aren't even mad by the end. Yeah. Because in the end of the day, they end up fighting well, those... Well, they didn't care where, where Alex, Marty, Gloria, and Melman came from. They just are, like, they're big, they're large, and they're in charge. Like, the, as long as the Fusa aren't gonna... And they end up fighting the Fusa, and they end up kicking their ass. So yeah, it worked out in the end. So that's yeah. why. Yeah. In other words, it's a little, it's a large reveal that didn't really matter in the end. Yeah. And maybe you could say that's bad writing. I just say I'm glad we're not dwelling on this for the whole second act of this movie. So yeah. for the whole half of the movie. So that's yeah. fine. That is fine. Yeah. Whew. Then again, the it's not really a lot of reveal plot because they didn't lie about anything. They just they they were stuck. No, they, on, they, they, they were stuck went on, along with it though, kind of like yeah, the yeah. bugs and bug life. You oh know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, whatever. The, it didn't matter. They all ended up being friends at the end, and they accomplished what they had to do. Um. Anyways, so my last cliche, I was okay. It would have been too easy if I talked about you know forced romances because everyone on every list of movie cliches has talked about forced romances to death. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna talk about something else in that's in a similar vein. Forced breakups. Like, let's say at the halfway point of your movie, you, these two, the, your male and female leads, you like them both, and then they hook up halfway through the movie, and they are a couple for the le- for the second half. But in the second act, low point, there is a there's a stupid argument that they have, or something dumb happens, or they learn something about the other, and they have to break up. Despite the fact that they were going so well, okay, a, a, a really some really bad examples that the just like uh, an earlier cliche of mine with the rah rah American saviors. There are tons of examples of this. 
Um, just a few that I could think of. Um, and yes, man, Zoe Deschanel, as soon as she finds out, like, why Jim Carrey is just saying yes to everything, she has to get all angry, and she has to break up with him. She can't just talk about why he has to say yes to everything. She has to break up with him. Also, in Hitch, as soon as she, as soon as Eva Mendes, by the way, what the hell happened to Eva Mendes? I don't know. As soon as Eva Mendes discovers that Will Smith is uh, one of the most successful dating coaches in New York, she has to have she has to have a moral objection to how she's helping how he's helping men, and he he has she has to paint him as the bad guy who's just t teaching men how to get into girls' pants, so they have to break up. Oh, and uh, in the four year old virgin, this is probably my personal. F my, yeah, I, I, hate like, I hate this. I hate this. Catherine Keener movie. and Andy have to break up because she can't understand why he's so hesitant to have sex. Like you could have just talked about it. Why? And you do talk about it like two scenes later. That's what's so annoying about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I guess that that move. Granted, that movie was more focused on like the male angle of being a, vir a virgin at the age of forty. There aren't that many movies that focus on what it's like to be a female 40-year-old virgin. Although, I mean... Hey, Hollywood, you never know. Hey, uh, the closest I've seen was uh, Christine Chubbuck and Christine, remember? Uh, uh, that didn't end well. That did not end well yeah. at all. Now, so, essentially, was she even 40? Well, I, pretty much. I th no, she's pretty close. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, no, they do mention her age. But the mm -hmm. point is, so, it's like, so, I hate it when, like... They have to fight over something so artificial. It's like, oh, and another example that made my list, Mr. Deeds. He, this girl that he's a lot of Adam Sandler movies. Oh too. God, yeah, like. But I think the problem is, is like, it's just it's an arbitrary second act low point for a lot of romantic comedies. Yeah, it happens a hell of a lot, and yeah. um, I even I, well, I I will admit my first student film had this cliche. And it's my least favorite part of that movie. I can't stand it. I didn't justify it well enough. Mm. I tried, but, you know, ultimately, well, I, I was just following I, a checklist. To me, I did notice that, but at the same time, everything else in that movie has a sense of brilliance to it. And it got into a film festival, so you did something right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah, so, and, the, but well, going back to the four-year-old version for a second, what I hated about that cliche is, it's, as fast as it happens, it's resolved. Like, literally two scenes later. Like, she goes over to his house to confront him, and then she thinks he's a pervert, which adds more complications. And then she gets he gets hit by a car. Oh, no, I forgive you all of a sudden. Oh, I'm a virgin. I'm... Oh, that's what this is all about? Aw, oh, Andy. Well, like, but here's the thing. I, did he, I, it's, a com, it's a Judd Apatow comedy, so it's like there had to be, like, an over-the-top climax for I him mean, to reveal. Judd Apatow has admitted that he's not very good at writing female characters, so there is that, too. <sighs> Look at how Knocked Up turned out. Like, I haven't even seen that movie. <laughs> I'm telling... Hey, I think Cody and I have both keep saying watch it. You might be surprised. Okay, it I'm, has its I'm, moments. I'm just not a big fan of Catherine Heigl. That's the thing. <laughs> uh, avoid the ugly truth. And then we'll call it even. I'll, I avoided all of her movies, so <laughs> no, no big deal. Oh wow! So, anyways, that's oh, but oh, I forgot. I almost forgot. Yeah, what's I, a good example of this? Okay, cliche? a good example, or you might, you may or may not disagree, but a good example of a movie that has this cliche but actually kind of honors it, La La Land. It, oh, okay, in La La Land, yeah. they, uh, me and Sebastian, they hate each other, but then. To quote The Simpsons, first they hate each other, now all of a sudden they love each other. Oh, it doesn't make sense to me. Of course not, you're a robot. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so, in La La Land, they hate each other, they get together, and then they're they're enjoying each other, they're, you know, milking each other's creative ambitions. But then, uh, he gets a big gig with John Legend's band, and he goes on tour, and get this, like... He's he's on the road for a while while she, Mia is struggling to get a play, one little play that she wrote, directed, and started herself off the ground. And Sebastian keeps raking in the bills, and then they have a really awkward dinner together where they have a big fight, and then they don't see each other again. And then he wants to go to her play, but he misses it because a show goes too long, and... He, see, he runs into her, like, packing her things as she's, like, 
crying her eyes out because like that was a big loss for her. Like she sank her per her she paid out of pocket to make that show and it failed. She she couldn't even pay back the theater. But then he tries to make up for it by getting driving her personally to the big audition that's gonna career define her. And you think they'd get back together. No, they don't. They actually kind of have her go off with some other stiff. But they so it's kind of implied that that little disagreement that they had made their romantic prospects, which could have been unsustainable ultimately, but they were always grateful. The way they look at each other at the very end of the movie, they were always grateful for each other for inspiring each other. And I like I like that one part in the movie where it's like a shadow play that shows, oh, what if they did get back? Yeah. To what if things did happen a certain By way? By the way, when, I saw, when like, I saw that in the theater, uh, the person in the, ro- in the row in front of me was crying. To quote Jules Winfield, I like that. That's not the way it works. <laughs> That's not how that is. Yeah. So, like, it shows what could have been, but ultimately wasn't. So, it's kind of done. That's where, like, the forced breakup is kind of done right. I'll be honest. Sometimes I kind of prefer it in a rom-com where, like, they don't get together in the end. And they kind of, like, you know, it's amicable, but, you yeah. know, they just didn't work out. Like, that's basically the point of Annie Hall. The whole movie right, is a dissection yeah. of a failed relationship, and I, I like that sort of thing sometimes. It's just a break from the mold, you know? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so, um, I mean, now, just to cap it off, let's take the piss out of ourselves. So to speak, speak cliches, uh, we always bring up Arthur, we always bring up The Simpsons, and it always seems to come back to those two shows. What can we say? Uh, They're the longest animated shows in recorded history. We just like them, so we like to talk about them, and they they formulate our camaraderie a little bit. You know, like we do. I see what you did there. That's more of a catchphrase than a cliche, I guess. Yeah. If anyone wants me, I'll be in my room. What kind of catchphrase is that? (laughs) Oh, see, we referenced The Simpsons. We did it again. No! Oh,